Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Phil Crook, Meeting Secretary of the RSS International Development Section. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's talk. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, some housekeeping. Uh, the RSS is recording this event and it will be put onto our YouTube collection together with the slides. If you wish to comment but are unhappy about being recorded, uh, please say so and we can take your, edit your contribution out of the recording. I'm going to let the speaker run through essentially uninterrupted and then open up for discussion. But during the talk, uh, please use the chat function to post your comments and questions as they come to mind. The Sustainable Development Goals were launched with great fanfare in 2015, and for most statisticians were a double-edged sword, greatly increasing the profile of statistics while also greatly increasing the workload. Uh, we're very pleased that Dr. Steve McFeely has found time to talk, talk to us about them today. Currently, Steve is Head of Statistics and Information at UNCTAD in Geneva. He's also Adjunct Professor at the Centre for Policy Studies at University College Cork in Ireland, Director of the ISAE International Standard Literacy, International Statistical Literacy Programme, Co-Chair of the Committee of Chief Statisticians of the UN System, and Chair of the Advisory Board of the Statistical Journal of the IOAS, and a member of the Advisory Panel to the UNDP Human Development Index. I don't know when he actually finds time to do his day job. Um, Steve writes extensively about many areas of statistics, and today he will focus on some aspects of the SDGs which are perhaps less noticed. So if you keep your cameras off, please. Now make sure you're all muted and I'll hand over to Steve. Okay, thank you, Phil. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And it's my great pleasure uh, to speak to you today. So let me just get my slides up. So can I confirm you can you can see the slides? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, Steve. great. So this talk, it's really an amalgam uh, of a few papers that I've published in recent years where I've been reflecting on Agenda 2030 and in particular the attempts to measure um, the Sustainable Development Goals. So just by way of background, I, I joined the United Nations at the end of 2014, just as the SDG process was getting underway. And at the start, I really didn't understand the process at all. I mean, working in Ireland, I'd never really given serious thought to the Millennium Development Goals. But as we began to assemble the SDG indicators, I really became intrigued by the process and what, what it meant for statistics, what it meant for measurement. And having attended some of the meetings on, with the policy side and with the negotiators, it kind of became apparent to me that they didn't fully understand the complexity of the task that they'd given to the statisticians. And I don't think they understood the implications either. And in a way, some of the papers I've, I've published, they were really my attempt to kind of work my way through that myself and, and understand what was going on. And, and that's what I'll kind of talk through today. So just to stress, these are personal reflections. These don't represent the views of anyone in the United Nations. So very quickly, some of this, I'm, I'm guessing you'll know if you're a development uh, expert group, but I'll, I'll talk quickly about the transition from MD, MDGs to SDGs, then talk about measuring the SDGs, mention some anticipated consequences, and then other things um, that come out of that that we could consider. So in part one, um, I'll talk about the, the movement or the transition from MDGs to SDGs. So the, the MDGs were a voluntary program. Um, they were really geared for developing countries. They weren't supported by any legal or binding instruments or UN resolutions. Um, but they were nevertheless politically and morally compelling and, and generated um, a lot of enthusiasm. But they weren't an, a formal intergovernmental mechanism. They were a UN secretariat initiative. And I, and I guess that that's the basis of some of the criticisms that came out afterwards, where the MDGs were quite heavily criticised for not reflecting the will of the people or the views of sovereign governments. And a lot of people accused them as well of being a donor driven agenda. From a measurement point of view, um, they had eight goals, 21 targets and 60 indicators. 
and I'll keep coming back to these sort of numbers throughout. At the end of the process, at the end of the 15 years, uh, more than 1 billion people had been lifted out of extreme poverty. Uh, under five child mortality had been halved. So th there was a lot of success. But in fact, when you look into the numbers, you realize a lot of that success came from, in particular, the, the rapid development in China, which lifted the global ag aggregates uh, very considerably. And from a statistical point of view, you could say there was only partial success because after 15 years, only two thirds or about 40 indicators uh, were actually populated. So it meant after 15 years, quite quite a, quite a few of the indicators uh, were still empty. If we move on to the SDGs, a, a, a very different scenario. So it's formally adopted by 193 heads of state, um, or 150 heads of state, 193 governments. It's universal, it applies to all governments. And now it's a much broader agenda. It, it covers the whole sustainability agenda. Um, it's people centered and so on. They, they do massive consultation in advance of the negotiated text. And, and via the online My Word survey, they solicit over 7 million um, responses. They consult with civil society, citizens, scientists, academics, private sector. So while it builds on the foundations of the MDGs, it's very, very different in that it's universal um, and it's much more ambitious. So it, now in, instead of reducing poverty, reducing hunger, it's about ending hunger and eradicating poverty. And again, from a numbers point of view, <coughs> excuse me, you see 17 goals, 169 targets, and eventually 231 uh, indicators. So a very sizable increase um, in the statistical task. Now, not surprising, but with a, with a project this large, it, it gets a mixed reaction. Probably the strongest negative reaction I, I, I saw in the lit review was in the, the Economist, um, where they say the SDGs are sprawling and misconceived. They've betrayed the world's poorest people. But they, they do make some valid points. I mean, the, 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 some of them are quite funny, like that they said that Moses had brought 10 commandments down from Mount Sinai. If only the UN's proposed list of development goals were as concise. And I think that there is some val validity in the criticism that the, it, it really lacks priority. I mean, it, it's very difficult to have 169 targets that are all simultaneously equally important. The other challenge is that measuring and communicating 231 indicators is going to be extremely difficult. And, and there's there, there's a large debate at the start of the statistical process as to what's the right way to go. Is it to try and measure everything, which would probably require about 500 indicators, or is it try or should we try and be more parsimonious? And in fact, eventually, the, we get a clear message from the the political side that they want at most uh, one indicator per target. Now, as you'll see, if there's 169 targets and 231 indicators, that didn't quite work out, but it wasn't far off. Now, on the plus side, a lot of people applaud the fact that it's a, it's a global vision, so it was easy to criticize the SDGs, but nevertheless, this is the first time in history that nations of the world have reached an accord and a kind of a vision on what development means. Um, and that in itself is, is, is a huge um, achievement. The targets are imperfect for sure, but a lot of people argue, look, that's the price of democracy. And it's a negotiated text, so it's a, it's a global agreement. Um, and, and, and these are all huge, uh, huge pluses. From a statistical point of view, again, it's also, as we'll see, a, a massive catalyst for statistical in innovation. Um, which is great, except there's there, there, there's issues over funding. So if we move on to the measurement then, to start with, I mean, the first lesson that, that I was surprised when I joined the UN that there hadn't been more reflection on the fact that after 15 years, 
quite a number of indicators were still unpopulated from the MDG process. I mean, that seemed to me a bit of a warning. I mean, the MDG requirements were quite modest, both in number and complexity. And, and yet we see kind of 30% of the indicators um, are unpopulated. And, and that kind of rings alarm bells for me. And I was very surprised that we we don't see more discussion about this in, in, the, in the lead up. In terms of scale, I mean, what we see is the number of targets or the number of goals have doubled. The number of targets have increased by a factor of eight and the indicators have, fact, have increased by a factor of four. So when the president of the 70th session of the UNGA says that it's a, an unprecedented statistical challenge, he, he's hitting the nail on the head. Um, and crucially, one, one of the differences between the MDGs and the SDGs is that for many of the, the indicators or the targets, th there is no statistical concept or definitions exist. Um, at the time, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Another challenge is around the number. So I, I've just picked two targets. Um, there, because because of the, the narrative that no, no one should be left behind, it, it, there's an inbuilt complexity that's kind of invisible when you look at the indicators themselves. And that's each indicator has a specified set of disaggregations that are acquired. And you can see that th those disaggregations vary by a, between six and 10 indicators um, or si six to 10 sub elements per indicator. So even though there's only 231 indicators, you can multiply them by the, the, the different elements that are acquired. And then you begin to understand uh, the level of detail that's really requir really required. So I've just given two examples there, but I mean, you, you could go through uh, any of them. I, another big challenge was trying to understand what did the targets mean? And, and this, I guess, was the downside of a negotiated text. Um, I think it's fair to say there was a lot of unresolved ambiguities and compromises that were left over in the political negotiations. And that was really left to the statisticians to resolve. And it might sound a bit pedantic, but when you're asked, when you're being asked to develop indicators to measure them, that's when you really need to start getting precise and ask, well, what exactly do you mean? Um, so the, eventually the, the UN agencies had to build an ontology and agree on what a lot of these words meant. So for example, the, the most obvious word is sustainable. What did that mean? Was that only, was that environmental only? Was it socially sustainable? Was it economic sustainable? And let, let's assume for a moment it was economic sustainability. Then what did that mean? Like that, that's not a, that's not a well understood term um, in economics. So there was a number of what seemed like commonly understood words that caused a lot of comprehension problems and challenges to ensure to make sure that we were producing consistent interpretation. So if we if we look at just one one indicator, just as an example, this is target 1.4. So by 2030, ensure that all men and women, in particular the poor and the vulnerable have equal rights to economic resources, as well as access to basic services, ownership and control over land, other forms of property, inheritance, natural resources, appropriate new technology and financial services, including microfinance. So I've just highlighted a few of those, but you could highlight many more. So what, what do we mean by poor? What do we mean by vulnerable? Huge discussions over what, what, what is a basic service? Um, you know, I mean, traditionally we, we might have thought of, of kind of water, food, um, shelter, but now in a modern era, does that include Wi-Fi? Does it include other things? What does control mean when we're talking about control over assets and property? What exactly does that mean? Which natural resources are we talking about? Which new technologies? So again, it, it might sound like pedantry, but this is these are the things that the statisticians have to decide because they're being asked to produce one indicator that's going to represent uh, this target. 
So there's, a, as you can see, there's an awful lot of choice even in, in there. So, so what do they do? And, and this is where the challenge arises around kind of prioritization. Because there's really no prioritization, it, it gives statisticians an awful lot of choice. Um, so if, if we look again at another target, 17.9, which is one that I've been involved in, there's really two elements to this, and it's not clear that they're that it's not clear that they're related. It really depends on interpretation. So the first part is looking at measurement of progress on sustainable development that complement GDP. Most of us interpreted this to mean this is kind of the beyond GDP discussion. So maybe green GDP, and uh, maybe this is incorporating uh, the, the human development index. Um, other elements of, of welfare. So, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot going on in that space alone. But then we also have this piece, which is to support statistical capacity development in countries. And it's not clear that that is statistical capacity development relating to the GDP or if it's just statistical capacity development. And there's a lot of arguments around this uh, within the, the statistical community. Another challenge that 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 face statisticians is the what, what what we can call the kind of global global versus regional or national, and this was another prioritization um, that had to be to be made. So, for example, if if you look at this um, at this target, you've got a mix of kind of global epidemics like AIDS or tuberculosis, but then you have more regional um, diseases like malaria that really only affect parts of the world and tropical diseases. So that the big challenge then is, well, what do you do for a global indicator framework? Do you pick diseases that are really important to some developing countries, or do you pick a disease um, or an epidemic that's global? And in fact, that's what happens. That for the global indicator, they, they pick global diseases like AIDS and TB. Um, and a lot of other really important diseases um, are dropped from the indicator. So all the time as well, then we start to see tension between countries and the global indicator framework, because what's important at the global level and measurable at the, at the global level is not necessarily what's important at the, at the regional level. The other challenge then is how to get globally comparable data. And, and this is an example of an indicator that's really at the kind of frontier of a, an emerging tension. Uh, well, it's not emerging anymore. It's now a real tension between the international organizations and the countries. And this really centers on this whole idea of the data revolution and, and using modern data. And I, I'll return to this point in more detail towards the end, but there was a lot of discussion around, well, which model makes sense? If you have a global data set, so for example, if you've good satellite data that can produce um, comparable data on forests around the world, does it make sense that each individual country produce an estimate of forests and, and supply it into the global indicator framework? Or does it make sense that one agency would do it once and then give it back to the country. So in other words, you could reverse the production model. And this raised that there was a lot of tension around this. And in fact, there was a, a, a very difficult negotiation between countries and international organizations and what's called the data flows document at the Statistical Commission in 2018 uh, to try and address this issue. But so th th these indicators ju just show you some of the the tensions that exist um, kind of in the measurement world that, that aren't necessarily that obvious uh, when you just look at the indicators directly. Now, the, the other big thing, of course, as I mentioned, is at the start. So if we look at the left hand side here, we see December 2016. The indicators, so there was there was 230 indicators originally. And they were classified by the statistics division into tiers. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the tiers. So let me go through them quickly. A tier one indicator meant it was conceptually clear. It had an internationally established methodology and standards. 
and you could produce data for at least 50% of the countries in every region where the indicator was relevant. So in other words, tier one meant we know what we're talking about and we have the data to measure it. Tier two indicators were conceptually clear. They have an internationally established methodology and standard, but we don't have the data. So in other words, we know what we're talking about, but we don't have the data to measure it. And then tier three, no international standards or methodologies exist, so we have no idea if we have the data or not. So tier three basically meant we don't know what we're talking about yet. We have a target and we've, from a statistical point of view, we've never tried to measure it before. So if you look at December 2016, you can see almost 40% of the indicators were tier three, meaning that we we, we had no real concept um, of what it was we were being asked to measure. We, we'd never measured it before. Uh, and this has been one of the big challenges uh, behind the scenes is, is the massive development that's gone on conceptually um, on, a, on a whole range of indicators. If we look at uh, six years later, so 2020 was the first what's called comprehensive review. And we see that there is no tier three indicators left. And that in itself is quite incredible. Um, that so, so many indicators um, have, have developed a conceptual framework. And I, I'll give one or two examples in a moment. But of course, the other challenge is that if you look at the clock at the top, you can see we're, we're in year six um, of a 15 year cycle. And yet oh, just over half of the indicators have sufficient data to be called or to be classified as tier one. Um, so, that, you know, there's a very real risk we'll be in a similar position to the MDGs at the end of this where we're not able to populate the full database despite all of the, the, the progress that we've made. And politically, I think that that could be problematic uh, because you're talking about so many more indicators now. The other big challenge, and this is a hotly contested issue at the moment, is how to define progress. Um, there, there's no consensus um, on this, and in fact, we see that there's quite a battle at the moment between the statistics division and the regional commissions who have developed different methodologies. Um, and that this is now a problem and the, the chief statisticians of the UN system are trying to address this now because it means different reports coming out of the UN are saying different things about the SDGs and whether we're on schedule or not. So a big question is what, what determines success? And that's not an easy question to answer because a lot of the targets don't have clear objectives and they don't have clear timelines. So again, there's a lot of there's a lot of scope for interpretation to try and decide um, how much of, of, of something is enough that you would consider it progress or on schedule. Another big challenge is what's the appropriate baseline? Um, it's not clear that selecting the same baseline for different indicators makes sense, especially for the new indicators that are just developing new conceptual frameworks. We, we don't have necessarily historic data. We also see maybe for environmental indicators, you need a much longer time series than maybe you do for economic indicators. And again, that's not clear. So th there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, room being left uh, for statisticians to decide these issues. So moving on then, so that's the background. So, so what are the consequences of all this? Well, I mean, first of all, I guess we should say with a program as ambitious as Agenda 2030, there's always going to be unintended consequences. In fact, the historian TJ Jackson Lears says all history is a law of unintended consequences. <laughs> I think he's probably right. But also unintended consequences aren't necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's just that we should be aware of them. So the first thing I, I think that certainly on the policy side, that that I, when I've said it to people, they have often been surprised. And in fact, some of them would argue with me or contest this statement, but I stand over it. I'm, the SDG indicators don't just measure the, the 2030 agenda, they define it because so much was left 
um, in a kind of an ambiguous state when it was handed over to the, the Statistical Commission. It's only when you really started to put indicators on it, that's when you started to really define what it meant. And it's the indicators that will decide ultimately whether something is classified as a, a failure or a success. And that's something I, th I don't think the political side really grasped um, and, and maybe still haven't. The other issue was that they wanted to keep things as simple as possible. So one of the kind of clear instructions we got was they wanted one indicator per target. And that makes sense from a messaging point of view. But of course, that that, that itself has, has implications then because as you've seen, a lot of the, the targets are multifaceted. So if you if you're going to select one indicator, it means you've an, you've an awful lot of choices to make because there's no way one indicator can measure everything. So the statisticians are being asked to choose which parts of the target that, that will be measured and which parts of the target won't be. The other thing that happened as well is once the, the text was agreed, um, the message came that they, they wanted the global indicator framework up and running very quickly. It was one of the big criticisms of the MDGs was that even though a lot of the indicator base wasn't populated, a lot of it wasn't populated until close to the end. So for maybe 10 years of the 15 years, they didn't have sufficient indicators to really understand what, what was happening uh, from a progress perspective. So the pressure came on very quickly uh, to populate the, the global indicator framework as best as possible. So naturally, of course, you know, we use indicators that we already have. So what we see a lot of the indicators are proxies that were actually designed for, for other purposes. And while that's fine, um, I, again, there's been limited discussion, surprisingly, on how well those indicators fit their new purpose. You know, like er, every indicator has its own history, its own idiosyncrasies, why thresholds were picked, um, why particular definitions were picked. And those, those definitions, those thresholds probably made sense in the context of their original purpose. But I think it's valid to ask whether they make sense uh, when they're repurposed uh, for, for the sustainable development goals. I, I touched on this earlier. I, I, another big issue has been in the instructions um, and, and in the debates, uh, there's a clear message from countries that the, the, the SDG global indicator framework is to prioritize official data that come from countries. That has a number of implications. I mean, there, there's a couple of indicators, say, in goal 16, which has to do with governance, where we know um, probably the, the least accurate data comes from the countries themselves, uh, especially around hu kind of human rights, uh, human rights abuses, things like that. But equally, in, in an era when we're, we're talking about trying to harness big data, trying to harness the data revolution, however you might define that, there's also tension where countries also highlight concerns and worries over data sovereignty and over messaging. And they realize that while using big data and everything is fine, if the UN are doing that to produce global indicators, the countries lose control of the messaging and there's clearly pushback on that. So while it, it, it's understandable and it's reasonable, you can also see situations where it's actually counterproductive uh, from an efficiency point of view or from a good measurement and kind of comparability point of view. I think, the, as we'll see in a moment, the one of the unspoken aspects of Agenda 2030 on the statistical world is the profound influence it's going to have on the shape and organization of official statistics going into the future. Um, we see already the SDGs are the driving force or raison d'etre for a lot of statistical advances at the moment. And I'm not sure that anybody really thought about that, but what we see was that the political agenda was way ahead of the measurement uh, agenda. 
and now statisticians are scrambling to to catch up. That scramble may may inadvertently open the door to outsource, outsourcing or privatization of some official statistics, and we we've seen pressures um, on, on this front. And this is where the population of the global indicator framework at the end will be very important because if the UN fails to deliver on a second development program from a measurement point of view, I think that's going to be politically difficult. But of course, on the other side, there's been no additional resources made available for the measurement of the SDGs. All of this work has really been done from within existing resources. Um, and that's the challenge both at the international level and also at the national level. So I just want to give you one or two examples of kind of developments that that have had to be really fast tracked in the last couple of years. So I've picked two that I'm involved with uh, directly. So one is indicator 16.4.1, which is about the, the measurement of uh, inward and outward illicit financial flows. Now, unfortunately, in the in the negotiated text, they use the word illicit. So we, we spent the first two years um, consulting around the world, uh, massive expert group panels on what did illicit mean? Um, what, what was the difference between illicit and illegal? Um, and why had the UNGA used the word illicit? So we, we had to go back through the text. We had to, to interview the negotiators to understand why had they used that particular word? And then the other huge challenge on the, the what we can call the commercial side. So the, the work here is shared between UNCTAD and UNODC. So the Office for Drugs and Crime deals with the illegal activities, um, which is generally kind of drugs, prostitution, stuff like that. UNCTAD is dealing with the, the measurement framework on the commercial side. So we're looking at things like uh, profit shifting, uh, price misinvoicing, um, kind of you know shoring up wealth. One of the huge issues here has been around tax avoidance. Um, in the economic literature, the, the, there's there's this concept of destructive tax avoidance, which is fine, but it that that makes it very difficult to measure. So tax evasion is illegal. And it, it's kind of more conceptually clear. What's much less clear is at what point, like where's the tipping point where tax avoidance uh, goes from normal tax planning uh, to aggressive or destructive tax planning. And, and that's been one of the huge challenges in this work is to, to work out a concept that all of the different agencies agree with, because obviously the IMF, the OECD, UNCTAD and so on, we come at this from different ideological perspectives as well, as do many countries around the world. So, so finding a, an agreement that we could put into a framework that everybody could live with um, has been a huge challenge. So it's only now you can see this was published in October 2020. Now we're developing a, the methodological guidelines, which are almost finished, and, and we'll start testing those in the second half of this year. So that, that, that's just one example um, of the type of development that, that's been going on behind the scenes. Another one, uh, a very, very political one, and sorry, the, the title is wrong here. It shouldn't be the value of illicit financial flows. This should be uh, the, the value of domestic re additional domestic resources. So ap apologies for the typo. Any of you who are familiar with South-South Cooperation or the OECD measure of total official support for sustainable development will know straight away what a landmine this is uh, politically. So the OECD proposed that they've developed a new indicator called TOSD or a total official support for sustainable development. And they proposed it would be the appropriate indicator for 17.3.1, which is additional resource mobilization. The Global South rebelled in no uncertain terms and said there was no way that, that this indicator what was going to represent their um, their work. And especially the South-South element of it 
that was for them to define. But of course, ha having kicked up a fuss, they, they, they then were completely inert in terms of doing anything about it. So they basically stuck to the argument that South-South cooperation couldn't be measured. And quite frankly, that, that that's not a viable, um, it's not a viable argument. So eventually the, the, the UN had really no choice but to set up a, a special working group, which is, is, is now working through this. And in fact, I chair a subgroup on the measurement of South-South cooperation. And we're slowly reaching a consensus in the South on what would be included within South-South cooperation and how we, how we would measure it. We're also working with the OECD then slightly separately to try and figure out how different our concept and measurement framework of South-South cooperation will be to the TOSD um, South-South framework. And in fact, that they're not that different, um, but there's obviously huge tension. And, and some of the tension arises because some of the larger Southern donors, uh, in particular India and China, they really don't want their South-South activities measured. And it's largely because even though it's South-South cooperation don't use the word donor or recipient, the larger countries are actually behaving like donors. Um, so in particular, the, the principles of what's called horizontality, which is the kind of mutual respect, we see they're really being honored more in the breach than in the observance. And we also see in some countries kind of a cultural ambivalence towards measurement um, or the idea of evidence-based um, uh, policy making. And of course, there's also tension about the idea of a northern institution telling southern countries how they should measure their activities. So these are just some of the, the kind of landmines that, that exist within the, the measurement framework. And, and they're just two examples. If, if you spoke to other agencies, I'm sure that they would have similar stories. Another element of, of the Agenda 2030 that really hasn't generated any discussion, surprisingly, I think, is that the Global Indicator Framework, we're really producing indicators for the purposes of assessing progress. So in other words, we're, we're really developing performance metrics. And the, the, the other, L, so like it's very much a downstream function. Um, you know, it's at the end, how are we doing? Are we achieving the target? Or are we not achieving the target? There's really been very little discussion or effort invested into the types of data and statistics that we need to actually inform policy. So like more the upstream function has really disappeared from the debate. Um, so we see in a way the global indicator framework has kind of hijacked the discussion. Everybody is so focused on, on, on building th these performance metrics because it's politically so important. The wider role of statistics has kind of been relegated. And, and you know, so we, we've just become kind of like a, a monitoring and evaluation function. So very much downstream, um, which, which is something I find very surprising. So moving on then to the, the last section. So some things that we could consider. So I argue that the Agenda 2030 has inadvertently opened up some new and unexpected opportunities to reimagine the traditional role of official statistics. And, and I'm going to talk about uh, four uh, very quickly. The first one is really on national data infrastructure. So what I mean here is there's basically what what I would call fundamental pillars that that every kind of national statistical system should have, and you can distill that into a, a sound legal framework, which would cons which would kind of reinforce professional independence. It would safeguard confidentiality, and it would guarantee access to primary and secondary data. You also need proper infrastructure and inc increasingly to get the value out of administrative data. What we see is the statistical offices need to become more involved with the wider national statistical system to ensure that registers, so registers either for persons, for businesses or locations 
are organized in a way that facilitate uh, the linking of those data. So this is really about the idea of unique uh, business or unique identifiers uh, that are used persistently and also about the common use of classifications that facilitate data to talk to each other. To do all of those things, you also need a much more formalized institutional coordination, which involves the statistical community, but also the, the technical specialist community and increasingly the geographic uh, or geospatial community. And the pressure that's that's been created by the SDGs creates the perfect opportunity to, to really encourage countries to start thinking about this in a more serious way. So in, in so what I mean is, is to start thinking about national statistical systems in, in a holistic way. So rather than just thinking about the statistics at the end, think about the statistics plus the upstream data and helping the governments to understand why that's important and help governments to organize those data in a way that, that are not only beneficial for statistics, but also beneficial uh, for a whole bunch of other reasons um, that could help the state to become more efficient. So this is really about kind of what we could call soft or non-physical infrastructure. And it's helping countries really to, to capitalize on this um, and, and kind of harness the, the digital inf and information age um, that exists. This is also very important, especially on the legal and organizational. Um, there's a lot of pressure now in developing countries to start using administrative data or big data if they don't have proper legal frameworks in place before they start doing that, it's only going to lead to disaster. Um, so they really need to take this type of infrastructure seriously uh, before they start developing anything else. The second opportunity, I would argue, is to, to kind of seriously start looking at the idea of formal accreditation. Um, there's a vast amount of not not just data, but there's actually a vast amount of indicators and statistics being compiled outside of the official statistical system. Um, probably some of the best examples at the moment are coming out of citizen science or citizen generated data. But they've no real avenue in to the um, the official statistics community. So there's there's this kind of divide and you know official statistics statisticians are obviously worried about the quality they're worried about the impartiality of those data so one idea is to actually establish some sort of a homologation authority that can actually formally accredit or certify the data and, and this i think feeds back into the discussion of reimagining what a national statistical system could do so you could do this at a national level or you could do it at the global or regional level. Um, and I think there's enormous potential here um, that could, you could really change the way we think um, about the way we produce. So in a way you could think of official statistics going from a purely production model to a production plus a franchise model. And um, this is something I think we need to think about. I mentioned this earlier, with, with the development now of global data sets, either coming from satellites or telecoms where there's few users or few producers, there's really an opportunity to rethink who produces what data. Now, I, I'm not talking about, this wouldn't apply to everything, but in the kind of big data space or maybe citizen science space, there are some global data sets. And again, there's an argument does it make sense that 200 countries all try and access the data and then try and build a comparable data set? Or does it make sense that one agency does it and then reverses the production model and gives the data back to the countries rather than the countries giving it to the UN or to the OECD or wh whoever it is? This is obviously a super sensitive topic um, because it gets to the heart of data ownership. It gets to the heart of kind of sovereignty and controlling the statistics of your own country. But nevertheless, th this is the reality that's coming uh, f from the new data ecosystems that are evolving. And it's something countries, I mean, for the moment, really, at the moment, the, the strategy is really just to, to not have the discussion. 
But I don't think we can continue to do that forever. I think at some point people are going to have to grasp this nettle um, and have a discussion and decide what's the optimal way to produce official statistics um, in the future. Then one last item is at the chief statisticians level, we've had some interesting discussions um, over the last year. And in fact, the, the World Data Report that was just published by the World Bank, they give us the opportunity to write a piece. So in Spotlight 8.1, the chief statisticians group have made the argument that we need a new global consensus um, for data or a new data convention. And this really touches on pretty much everything I've spoken about to date. It's, it's the tensions that are emerging between we want to produce data as a global public good, but a lot of the data are now proprietary and a lot of private sector stuff uh, companies understand that data are now a commercial asset. So we see tensions within the open data movement where the open data movement is very much focused on government. But yet, private sector. There's no private. There's no pressure on private sector. We also see the importance of data is now changing. It's now a geospatial issue or a, a geopolitical issue. Sorry. So traditionally, we we might have thought as data purely as a, a tool to inform policy. But in fact, data in itself is now a, a global policy issue. Uh, Digital data is the key to, to international trade, to especially services, which means that how you share data um, is at, it's the bedrock of international trade, which is why people are so sensitive about it. So, but this this again raises tensions about individual privacy, individual rights, um, the common good versus the individual good. Who decides, you know, which takes priority? So we see now that data is really at the heart of a huge amount of bigger policy issues. Um, and yet all of these are being discussed in silos. It's the same when you look at uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, all the discussions around artificial intelligence, when you boil them down, essentially what you're talking about are data. So we're arguing that there needs to be a, a new type of global convention, but it would be a new type in the sense that traditionally conventions have been negotiated by countries. But a data convention, if we look forward, it can't be negotiated by countries alone. It must include the private sector. It must include people who represent citizens. Um, so it, it, it would be a much more complex uh, proposition. But we think it's one that uh, that has to be had. So to, to wrap up, um, thank you for your patience. The Agenda 2030 is the first democratically forged agreement um, on development. It's going to gu guide development for the next 10 or 15 years, but it's going to profoundly influence a lot of statistical developments. And as we see, it's the driving, driving force behind a lot of new statistical uh, frameworks and so forth. But there's many constraints, not least financial. Um, but despite that, uh, the, the IAAG has made tremendous progress, I think, and the global indicator framework has been assembled in record time. But it's still only kind of basically half full. And the, the you know the jury is out on how how full will it be at the, at, in, in another seven years time. A lot of the SDG indicators that they've been criticized for missing targets or being reductionist, watering down the ambition of the goals of the targets. But I mean, I, I would argue, I mean, statistics by their nature are reductionist, but in particular, given the complexity of the targets and the requirement to only have one indicator per target, it was unavoidable. But the big question then is whether this unavoidable distillation has captured the essence of the targets faithfully or not. And I think that, that that that's open to debate. I don't think the policymakers, the people who negotiated the text, understood at all that in delegating the measurement to the statistical community, they were also delegating the meaning of Agenda 2030. I think a lot of people still don't understand that. And I don't think either they understood the complexity um, of the proposition. Um, we had some very interesting interviews 
uh, with the, the the Irish and Kenyan ambassadors who negotiated the the text, and it was clear from them their attitude was that once the text had been negotiated, that was the hard part over, and that you know really the measurement piece was you know kind of easy. Um, so they were kind of quite surprised that that we were pushing back on that and saying, well, it, it's anything but. But at the same time, so I mean, what we hope is no matter how good or bad the indicators are, that hopefully they offer at least some common ground um, that will facilitate policy discussions um, and agreement on whether we've made progress or not. As I've argued, I think because we focus so much on the global indicator framework, we have lost sight a bit of the wider role of statistics and development. Um, so as I said, the, the upstream role seems to have disappeared and we're very focused on the performance metric element, which I, I, I think is a pity. Um, and finally, I think the SDG process does offer a, a huge opportunity for statisticians to engage and reflect with data users on what the future of official statistics should be. Because you know, almost certainly there'll be another development program in seven years time. So I think the statistical community really needs to start thinking now about what we would like the future to be. What mistakes did we make in the MDGs and the SDGs? And what mistakes can we avoid uh, the next time around? So with that, uh, I'll finish there. Thank you. Well, gosh. Thank you very much, Steve, for that extraordinary um, trip from the what seems now relatively benign MDGs through to this uh, oh complete I, I, this web of possibilities and chances and opportunities and for yes no I'm still trying to digest it actually I still I still don't understand why. At the beginning of the SDG process, I thought the whole idea of getting the statisticians involved from day one is that we could have baselines and targets, but they must they must have just got lost in the wash. Can I open this up now? Who would like uh, who would like to make some comments or ask some questions of Steve? Denise. Thank you very much, Steve. It was fantastic talk. Hi, Denise. Really, yeah, it was a great talk. Um, how you managed to get so much material into less than an hour, I'm staggered by. Um, just a few comments about a few a few things. The first is, I was at the Millennium Conference in 2000, and I think countries did sign up. Um, there were conventions and they did sign up, so I didn't quite recognise what you said there. But I think one of the interesting things was that um, the richer countries were all represented by heads of aid or international development. They weren't represented by ministers who would actually have responsibility for the performance in relation to um, the MDGs. So immediately there was a sense in which even though richer countries signed up to them, they were signing up on behalf of their aid budget for, uh, for poorer countries rather than for themselves. And, and certainly the discussions, because I was director of statistics at UNESCO at that time, and the discussions that we then had about prioritization of what education data was needed um, was certainly influenced by uh, the fact that the richer countries thought that we should only concentrate on, on issues that were of relevance to the poorer countries of the world. So I'd agree with you there, but I think I think there were conventions and they did sign up. You didn't say very much about the fact that um, one of the implications of the both the MDGs and the SDGs is this focus on change over time and that we're overemphasizing annual change. And some of the things that we're measuring change much slower than annually and we risk uh, we risk over-interpreting, really, and we, we're looking at noise rather than real change. And I also think that that's been 
um, a great pressure for not improving the indicators because particularly when they're fed into things like the Human Development Index, um, there, isn't, uh, there isn't an understanding that you want to make improvements to your statistics, but that's going to, to have implications for change over time. And then the last comment, um, really interested in your ideas for the future, and I need to, like Phil, I need to go and think about those in a lot more detail. Here in the UK, we had lots of discussion um, at the time that we had the last statistical legislation about whether or not we should have some sort of accreditation system for statistics that weren't produced by the official agencies, produced by quangos and, and other bodies. Um, and I don't think that's been solved in the UK. I still think this is an issue that we're trying to address. And so I think the whole issue of whether national statistics officers and international statistics bodies become more coordination agencies and setting the standards and quality assuring um, rather than directly collecting. I think that's a really interesting issue. Thank you. Great talk. Um, do you want to quickly just reply to that, Steve? Okay, not... sure. Well, look, on the first one, I mean, I wasn't around in 2000 at the Millennium Development Conference, but when I go through the literature, the, the universal consensus is that, um, well, as I outlined it, when, when, you, when you read everybody's interpretation, um, is that it, it wasn't universally signed up to. So we, 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 can, we can argue with that, but certainly when we get to the SDGs, I mean, I, the second part of your comment certainly resonates because what we saw at the start is that the developed world really didn't take the SDGs seriously for a long time. And I think the developing world was much more bought in, I think because the MDGs had been foot they had signed up to them and they were used to it. There was two reactions from the developed world. I think one was pushback that they were going to be monitored. I think they were quite happy to have the develop, the developing world being measured and monitored. They didn't like the idea at all that now they were going to be uh, measured and monitored. Um, and you could see that they they didn't really buy into the process with the exception of a few, you know, the, the usual kind of Nordic countries um, most European countries um, and other developed countries were very slow to kind of engage with the SDGs. I think the the issue of change over time, I, I think that's a really good point. And that that that's kind of really that's come up in the in the, the, the baseline argument because you have kind of the environmental people saying, look, you know, short term change is meaningless um, if, if we're looking at temperature changes and stuff. So the idea that we would set a universal time base at 2015 is ridiculous. You know, we need to be looking over a century. Um, and surprisingly, it, it's, it remains an unresolved issue and kind of agencies have really been left to interpret things as they want. But it, the debate comes up recurringly, you know, why can't we have consistent baselines? Um, and it's very hard to explain to people that, well, it doesn't necessarily make sense. On the accreditation, well, actually, on the accreditation, I've had a lot of correspondence recently uh, with the ONS. So the the ONS, or well, maybe it's not the ONS directly. It's it's the authority above it. The I forget what you call it. The, the UK Statistics Authority. Yes. Yeah, so so they're working on this now. So we we published a paper about a year and a half ago on on this idea of accreditation, and they were on to us very quickly, as were France. They were the two NSOs in Europe that contacted us very quickly and said, look, we're looking at this, you know, can we talk to you? Um, and they've been back a few times bouncing ideas off us. So th there does seem to be something going on um, in the UK, at least. Um, a, a lot of the pushback that we got there, we, 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 we presented the idea for the first time at the ISI um, in Malaysia. And... The main pushback we got was really concern about resources in developing countries. You know, was this just a bridge too far where they're already struggling to do basic stuff and now you're asking them to set up um, some sort of an accreditation board. 
Which is a fair point. But look, you know, statistics doesn't develop evenly across the world. So I still think some of the more developed countries could look at this and show the way, you know, test it, and then other, other countries may, may catch up in time. Right. OK, thanks, Steve. That's interesting. Um, we've got Atanaska Nikolova uh, has got a question. Atanaska. Thank you. Um, hello, thanks, Steve, also for the um, really good talk. A lot of material packed in there. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much for that. And I guess I just wanted to um, follow up on the last point with the accreditation. Um, I work at the ONS and I'm part of the um, team that is sourcing um, data towards the um, Sustainable Development Goal, um, the progress for the UK. Um, so yes, I just wanted to um, emphasize that uh, the point at which you already did mention about the um, UKSA and what they've been doing towards this. So there is no formal accreditation system per se, but there is um, uh, the OSR, Office for Statistics Regulations, has developed this um, voluntary application process. So um, non-official statistics producers are invited to um, put in writing how they um, voluntarily conform with the UKSA Code of Practice for Statistics. And this is then reviewed by the OSR and there is a list of um, voluntary adopters, so to speak. So they're not formally accredited, they don't count as official statistics, but um, being on that list and having the official commitment to um, abide by the code um, and showing how with this particular statistical output um, helps really um, very much towards uh, building trust in these statistics in these statistics and I think you know opens a lot of um, opportunities for non-official producers so I think that's a really great step um, towards that and then in parallel um, at the um, at the uh, SDG team at the ONS we are working on our own um, system for um, sort of a triage system for um, assessing non-official sources. Um, and I think I, I have actually um, briefly been in touch with you regarding that a couple of months back, you may remember. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're working on a, a paper which we're hoping to publish soon, which has a um, like a gateway and a scoring system to help us basically make decisions on which sources, non-official sources are suitable. Um, to use on our national reporting platform. So it's very, very SDG specific in terms of, you know, how we score things and, you know, it relates to the UN metadata and um, other um, very SDG specific bits, but it can be adopted for a wider use. So, you know, we are trying to take steps towards that. Although again, it's not, um, it's not, it's by no means a formal um, accreditation, but um, again, I think it's quite a good step in that direction. So yeah, just to say there is a lot of development in, on that front, and um, we're definitely aware that there is a lot of potential in non-official statistics, and we would like to exploit that as much as possible. Excellent. Well, thanks, uh, Atanaska. <laughs> do, do you have any comeback for that, Steve? Well, just, just, just to thank her. Um, I mean, the point Athanaska made, there's two points. One is, it's one of the incentives that we 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 pondered on. So when when we were when we were proposing the idea of accreditation, we we still think kind of the UN or say in the in the, in the case of the, in the UK the ONS, those agencies are are respected enough that if they were to issue some sort of a quality badge, that that actually is worth a lot. I I, I don't think statistics offices understand in a lot of cases um, how well respected they are and I think that th there we think that there could be a lot of kind of non-official data that would actually find that attractive to have a kind of like the ISO standard or the you know the official statistics badge whatever it would be called because you know it would say something about the quality of their data um, and then the second point at NASCA made which is interesting because we we also we suggested something similar. We suggested starting with the SDGs and using the SDG indicators as a sort of a petri dish for this idea before you kind of spread it wider into the wider realm. So, you know, because no matter how big the SDGs are, there's a limited set of indicators. So we thought maybe that's a good control group. 
that you could test this idea. And then if it works, it has obvious implications then for a whole range of other statistics. But maybe to kind of reassure statistical offices that are a bit nervous about this, that you know, maybe you start with a, a more limited control group. Mm. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. And uh, Mikhail Foster now. Uh, Mikhail, you had some comments or questions. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, firstly, just want to start by saying that um, it was a very, very solid presentation. Learned quite a lot. Um, just some of the points that um, came to mind for me was specifically in regards to how has the SDG taken consideration of um, political agendas and how potentially this may impact on the achievement of those SDGs. Because I remember you stating specifically that one of the challenges that you're going to be having is that over the over the six years that we've gone by so far, we've only touched on about 54% of outlining what those actual specific terms are. But then as you'd understand, like for example, in Brazil, because of how, what the political um, temperature is right there at this moment in time, then they have a bit of a stranglehold on how those organizations go about trying to achieve more of those um, social and environmental, um, those social and environmental goals. So I'm just wondering how exactly they would have factored those in, in regards to them not being able to achieve that goal, especially if they continue along that political climate. And the other aspect I want to look at, I was thinking of as well, is in regards to multinational companies. When you consider that in when you look at what multinational, the impact that especially tech companies, the roles that they had in 2000 in comparison to the roles that they have now, and the number of budgets, the large budget that they have, and the multinational footprint that they have as well in regards to utilizing resources all across the world, then how have we thought about bringing those companies to the table as one of the key as one of the key members in being able to try and achieve these SDGs in a more efficient and um, multi multinationally appropriate way? Thank you. Well, Steve. Okay, two interesting questions, Mikhail. Thank you. So, how will I start this? When the, the first meeting of the IAG, so the Interagency Expert Group on SDGs, was held in New York. And I think it's fair to say it wasn't a successful meeting. Um, it was very well attended, but it it was very, very political. And in fact, the, the decision was made after that meeting uh, to, to move the IAGs out of New York. And that was a deliberate decision by the Statistical Commission um, and, and UNSD, because one of the things that the Statistical Commission was really proud about and the members of the Statistical Commission were very proud of was the fact that we'd been given the task of measuring the SDGs and it was it was felt this was recognition of the professionalism of official statisticians but also that it was deliberately done to depoliticize the measurement element so when the first meeting of the IAGs happened that that it, it didn't go as expected now, I'm happy to say since then it's largely remained on like it, it it's been successful in that we've managed to pull away from the the missions so you know it's it's back to statisticians uh, attending the meeting now I mean obviously there there's a political element to all of the decisions I was talking about because if you're having to interpret um a broad and ambiguous target and decide, well, which bits are you going to measure? That's inherently a political decision. I mean, you because you can call it statistical, but you know, essentially it's a political decision. But statisticians are doing that all the time. Um, I, mean, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but what we've tried to do as far as possible is, is depoliticize the decisions and try and make decisions that make sense. But you know, th th that's what makes sense to me. And I come from a particular cultural background. So, you know, th there's no such thing as a, a as a purely neutral indicator. Um, but I think in general, th the Statistical Commission has done a good job of, re of keeping it fairly impartial uh, and keeping the political system out of the, the kind of day to day technical discussions. On the MNEs, there's 
there's actually only one um, target of the 169 that involves the private sector. And it's, it's 12 point something. I think it's 12.4, 12.3 or 12.4, which is to do with sustainability reporting. Um, again, it's a new indicator. It, it was tier three two years ago. It's been classified now as tier two. In fact, I'm I'm involved in that as well. And, and that's a very, it's a very kind of data science project. So we're, we're what we're doing is we're, we're, we're web scraping um, um, re commercial reports or financial reports and stuff to see which companies are now reporting on a sustainability basis because this is one of the new requirements of what's called ISAR, which is the International Standard for Accounting Regulations. So it's where statistics and accounting have now become aligned. So there are now standards for what's called sustainability reporting. Um, and we're we're now trying to go through all of the accounts to see how many are actually adopting the new indicators. Um, very few is, is what we're picking up so far. I mean, there's been relatively small pickup, but it's the only part of the SDG process where the private sector effectively has been held to account. In, in every other aspect, it's it's the member state. Um, but if, if I can flip that discussion on its head, when I when I come back to the open data, I mean. The, this is the other side of that discussion is the power of some of the IT platforms, which are, I think, all MEs, and um, the, the amount of data they hold. Um, and, and we've seen it, you know, with, with the with the COVID crisis. I mean, the, the amount of stuff that they could tell governments about what was going on was far greater than what any government uh, could could do. And and obviously, I mean, that's a that's a concern from a number of points of view in that governments are held to account over what they know about their citizens um, the private sector really isn't and i think the other point of view from from a modern statistical point of view we really are struggling to get to grips with this because we, we don't really have access to most of those data we don't have much experience using it um, and without question that 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 it's going to make a major contribution in the future but you know, there, there's all sorts of biases and problems that we have to deal with, but we have to deal with that anyway, with, with the data we have. So you're going from one imperfect source to another. Um, but yeah, it's a huge untapped resource and there's a lot of talk about big data, blah, blah, blah. But really and truly, when you look at it from an official statistics point of view, there hasn't been that much action. And a lot of it is down to legal barriers, um, issues around data protection, and and finance like access and being able to afford what is now a commercial asset. Excellent. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, have we got any other any more questions or comments? I see time is moving on. No. In that case, it just remains for me to say on behalf of everybody a big thank you to Steve for his for his talk, which was extremely interesting. I might go and sit down and watch it again when it gets loaded on the RSS YouTube platform, so which should be sometime next week. If you found it interesting, do tell your colleagues uh, that they can find it in due course uh, on the RSS's YouTube website. So thank you very much, Steve. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for listening. And uh, just to let you know, this will be one of my last talks uh, coming from Ongtad, I'm moving over to the WHO um, shortly to take up a position as chief statistician there. So the next time I talk to you, I'll be talking about a different set of issues. It won't be illegal financial flows anymore. It'll be, no. <laughs> uh, it'll be well, everything else, malnutrition, hunger, yeah, food exactly. security. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, excellent. Well, it's uh, WHO will be getting great deal of benefit from that scene, I would have thought. Let's hope so. Okay, and goodbye to everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again.